Council member of the Centre for Crop Circle Studies, uh, and over the years has been very involved with the world of lens making. Uh, this kind of business has led Richard to all sorts of insights, and he's travelled around the world meeting lots of people. And recently, Richard came into more contact with the Hindu culture, and realized that many of the traditions of the Hindus had a lot to say about what's going on in our society today. So this is what Richard's going to share with us. He's a founder member of the Parallel Community with people like Hamish Miller, and I'm sure he's going to tell you about that. But uh, please give a big welcome to Richard Smith. <clears throat> Thank you for those kind words, Andy and Sheila. And it's a wonderful pleasure to be back in Glastonbury again amongst so many awake people. I think at the moment all of us realize that there is a great feeling of change happening. And I think this weekend you're going to hear an awful lot about change. My wife Anne and myself, we spent the last three months last winter traveling in Southeast Asia. And when you travel for an extended period of time, rather than just go for a two or three week beach holiday, it gives you an awful lot of time to reflect and to think about things generally. I think conclusively we are in a situation now where a lot of us think that change is absolutely inevitable, but wishing the world to be the way we want it to be is no longer enough. The fluffy bunny era is over, which is one of Andy's expressions, I think. And also, the age of cynicism is dead. There is absolutely no point just moaning about it. What on earth can we offer in terms of solutions? We just can't bitch and moan about things anymore. So we have to recognize these three things. The recognition of the truth of our global situation and how we got here. We have to think unthinkable thoughts and deliver the undoable answers. Because as we've seen recently since the financial problems have come up internationally and so on, things are not so bright. We spent some time, if any of you have been to Cambodia, Angkor Wat, this is an incredible complex and it covers some 77 square miles of temples. Now, you look at something like this, absolutely colossal, and you think, what kind of lunatic would possibly build these and hundreds and hundreds more like it? But this is the, the really big one of all. And it isn't a processional thing. This is a most extraordinary place. They have a lot of very high thresholds. So there's no way thousands of people would troop through here. So this was really built for the king and the religious people. And I thought, very strange to build this for yourself. And I thought, this guy must be completely nuts. Then I discovered that he actually built 102 hospitals for his people. So perhaps not so bad after all. And of course, this was built around about the time, 12th century, not so long after the Battle of Hastings. And this really was a, quite a developed society. I know you'll find this extremely hard to believe, but we had a camera malfunction in here. And I'm looking at this thinking, what on earth is this yellow thing in the sky? But actually, it was a hot air balloon. But we did, we did have a camera malfunction while we were there, so there we are. Now, those of you who haven't been to Angkor Wat, these galleries surround it. It's a, about a kilometre square and a huge moat surrounding it. And these galleries run on all four sides. It's absolutely enormous. And we were very lucky to be there. The tourist authorities say, get there for sunrise. It's fantastic. We didn't. We went during the middle of the day. And of course, uh, you know, we had the place to ourselves, which is rather nice. Now, the churning of the ocean of milk. There was a, a large bar relief. It's something in the order of 49 meters. And what is happening here, you have gods and demons, and they've all got a huge chunk of snake tucked underneath. And there are 180 of them. There are 92 gods and there are 88 demons. And what they're actually doing is they're making a mountain swivel. So the gods pull one way, then the demons pull the other, and eventually, after a thousand years, they are producing, they're producing the elixir of life. Okay, So all the effort going into producing the world and then so what they're doing is you see here not so easy to see but they're pulling on this 
So there we are, we've got them going one way and the other, and the mountain is rotating. And after a thousand years, they actually produce the elixir of life. And these are the galleries that just go on and on. Now, here we have the mountain, and here we have the gods pulling one way, the demons pulling the other. I know it's early in the morning, but we're now all going to go on the pull. Okay? This side of the hall are gods, and this side are demons. Now, there was a certain logistical problem trying to issue some rope to get you to all do this, okay? So I want you to think about this. So the gods are going to pull one way, and the demons are going to pull the other. Now, I see one or two demons looking at each other thinking, I don't want to be a demon, I'd rather be a god. <laughs> well, I'm married to a dragon. <laughs> so you think you've got problems. When the thousand years is over and the elixir of life is produced, we'll follow that later on. But uh, just keep pulling, okay? Just keep pulling. Now, the elixir of life to me is what raised us from the, most of these species and the animals. We actually do go one better. We're much more interested in things like reason than we are just simple survival. So... Once the elixir of life, truth and freedom, to me, it may be different things to you, but these are really, really the crucial things. But what is freedom? Is it liberty? Not really. We are at liberty in the sense that if we're not in jail, we're at liberty. What are our rights? We're, we have rights to do certain things in society. But there are two types of freedom. Isaiah Berlin, the philosopher, memorably described freedom two ways. Is there is positive freedom and there is negative freedom. Now, positive freedom, I'm not that concerned with because I think many, many fine minds and philosophers have actually applied themselves to this. Positive freedom is your right as a member of society to partake of certain things. Negative freedom, however, is freedom from the arbitrary exercise of authority. So what is happening to us today, I'm going to trace this right back to the French Revolution because what is happening to us today is actually has happened to us in the past we have to be extremely aware of how the state is removing our individual freedom. A classic case of negative freedom. Two years ago, we elected no longer to have a television. No, no. <laughs> Don't think you can get away with that. When you buy a television, the suppliers actually will then tell the DVLA that you have a TV. Now, they don't produce a label that says, if you don't have a television anymore, send this in and we won't come after you. This actually says that your property is under investigation. This is effectively a surveillance notice. Now, that's okay for us. We were able to deal with it. We roped in the MP, our local MP, and said, how dare these people do this? They are not coming into my house. As those of you that were here last year and heard Peter Tatchell say, they have 266 rights of entry to your house, the authorities. I said, they are not coming to our house. If they knock on the door, they can get lost. He said, well, they can come in. I said, no, they can't. But this is actually, this is shocking. And a lot of older folk who get this are seriously worried that they are going to run into a major problem. So this property is currently under investigation. Who on earth do these people think they are? Because I don't want to watch Coronation Street or Neighbours. Sorry, I don't have to have a television and you don't have to come after me in this way. I think it's an absolute disgrace. I put it up here because it's an absolute classic case. I deserve freedom from the arbitrary exercising of authority, and that's exactly what this is. It's, it is police. Now, this actually got me interested in the whole question of freedom. Um, I could, going back to the French Revolution in 1789, because this is the time where the French actually said, right, we are sick to death of the excess of the, the people who are basically just consuming, it was absolutely ostentatious gone berserk. The aristocracy behaved incredibly badly, and the French no longer were going to put up with this. Now, several of the declarations, I'm not going to go through them all, but the, the first article in the Declaration of Rights of Man in 1789, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions may be founded only upon the general good. Article 4 said, liberty consists in the freedom to do everything which injures no one else. Now, me not having a television doesn't injure anybody else. Hence, the exercise of the natural rights of man has no limits except those which assure to the other members of the society the enjoyment of the same rights. 
And these limits can only be determined by law. And finally, the really relevant article, Article 11, the free communication of ideas and opinions is one of the most precious of the rights of man. Every citizen may accordingly speak, write, and print with freedom, but shall be responsible for such abuses of this freedom as shall be defined by law. So that all 17 of those articles responded to the neglect of basic human rights, which the French aristocracy inflicted upon the people fundamentally. Now, the United Nations Resolution of 1948 speaks exactly the same language. Fundamentally, the issue of freedom never really changes. Interestingly, in June this year, the French courts ruled that international in internet access is now a basic human right. Interesting. Okay, now, I found, looking at these things, what I call the law of 43. After 17, through 1789 to 1832, the first Reform Act, then we went through to 1875, 43 years later, the Second Reform Act of 1867, all the way through to the end of the First War, and then to 1961, Kennedy, OPEC was born, various other things, and then up to 2004, and then we get a chance to speculate on the future. Okay, French Revolution. These three guys basically had a huge influence on, on what happened during this period. Um, our friend here, Napoleon, obviously he, he took charge in 1793, and I think most of you are very familiar with what happened there. Wellington, of course, he was responsible for dealing with Napoleon. Wellington was quite interesting because he said, we have a perfect democracy, we don't have to change anything in, this, in the country. But what was the UK's government, uh, UK government's reaction to the French Revolution? It was to clamp down hard. In much the same way as we now have the war on terror and the, the government reaction to all, the, all this, similar things actually were happening in those days. Uh, Edmund Burke said that uh, when your neighbor's house is on fire, it actually does well for the engine to play a little on your own. In other words, they were very, very worried about cross-contamination across the channel. However, society continued to be very, very one-sided in the UK, and the authorities were extremely worried about the possibility of revolution here. So in 1819, the six acts, we have no public meetings, we ta they tax newspapers to ensure people couldn't afford them. Magistrates were able to seize blasphemous literature. How familiar is all this beginning to sound? In the same year, children between the age of you know, 9 to 16 could work a maximum of 12 hours a day. Hmm, nice. In 1828, Catholics were admitted to Parliament for the first time. Not massively significant unless you're a Catholic. However, it did demonstrate reform was possible. In 1830, the southern counties rebelled because, again, none of the wealth of the increasing industrial, industrial revolution was actually getting down to worker level. And people said, why is it that in Manchester, 250,000 people have no MP, and we have a place called Dunwich, off the coast, under the water, sending two MPs to Parliament? This is nuts. Even the most unenlightened people said, well, this is nuts. So after a long battle in 1832, the first Reform Act was passed, which gave the vote to a quarter of a million people on top of the 500,000 already had it. Well, that's not a huge amount. The Chartists who realized that they had surrendered slavery for an apprenticeship to liberty said, this is crazy. So the 1830s were not a terribly comfortable time either. They had six demands. They wanted the vote for 21-year-olds. They wanted secret ballot. They, didn't want a pro they wanted a property qualification to be an MP. They wanted MPs to be paid. They wanted equal constituencies and annual parliaments. Now, everything apart from annual parliaments which won't work have actually come into law, so they fundamentally were ahead of their time. Now, Queen Victoria, she was the first person really to take monarchy, I think, very, very seriously. She actually cleaned a lot of things up. She gave a certain amount of prestige to the thing. This chap here, chimney sweep boy, in 1875, a chimney sweep could only be a chimney sweep if he had a license that said, I don't send small boys up chimneys. So there was a certain element of society becoming a little bit enlightened. In 1867, the Reform Act actually, again, elected a lot of, uh, enabled an awful lot of people to come onto the electoral roll. So we had another million 
to, uh, to add to our 750,000 already. Gladstone, bless him. This guy is really, really important. You know why? He was the last guy to seriously propose the abolition of income tax. Oh, what a lost opportunity. <laughs> he proposed to do this for the 1874 election semi-seriously. His biographer, John Morley, said that he was actually considering doing that, but whether or not, I don't know. Now, in 1872, there was a royal commission into the lack of science teaching. See, nothing really changes. We still have a shortage of scientists and a shortage of people taking science seriously. Okay, 1875 to 1918. The Industrial Revolution, very important. This country had a massive, huge, enormous influence on the modernization of the world. We had a very brief opportunity where we were number one. We did rule the waves. Our trade routes were protected by the Navy, all that kind of thing. And we had another Reform Act in 1884, which added another two million to the 100, well, the, the one and three quarter millions already had the vote. So bit by bit, more and more of us are getting the vote. The First War, of course, uh, well, I don't need to go over huge amounts of the First War. Suffice to say that the military people completely screwed it up. Lloyd George and company uh, employed business people to sort it out, and, and eventually the war actually was, was won. But there are an awful lot of uh, those of you who are aware in detail of the history of the First War. It's a, it's a very, very long and interesting story, but an awful lot of English industry was modernized during those years, actually of necessity. Interestingly, um, the Balfour Declaration of 1917, which we'll come on to, had its roots in the munitions industry because we were very short of acetone, and apparently you need acetone to make shells. And a guy called Dr. Weizmann was actually given the task of coming up with acetone for the munitions production, and he managed to synthesize that from maize. And eventually he did it again with horse chestnuts. But this is a, this is a, uh, this will come onto the Balfour Declaration on a bit later on. Um, <clears throat> the USSR, of course, again, they mismanaged the first war as well. The Russians were given a very, very hard time, and the revolution of 1917 meant that the communism was actually born. So, again, the, the interesting part of the First War, again, the, the Kaiser said to an American diplomat, don't worry, when the time is right to make peace, I will talk to my cousin George and my cousin Nicholas and we'll deal with it. We don't need Democrats like you. So the, serious, the royals seriously proposed that this, the First World War was basically a royal game and they would fix it. No, not when the time is right. So, there we go. Okay, uh, some of we're getting a bit more up to date now. In current terms with the financial situation, the 1929 crash was very, very... There are a lot of parallels to what's happening today. We're in a situation now where we've, uh, we have suffered from highly inflated asset rates, and the same things were happening in the 1920s, whereas that their reaction then is slightly different to what is happening today. And... Whereas today we are printing a lot of money, in those days they were said, right, okay, to solve this problem, we really do need to let the, all the debt problem flow right through the system and get rid. Several things happen when capitalism comes under these sort of pressures. It, society will either go socialist, in other words, the government will take over and do all it can to preserve banking systems and everything else, which is really what's happening today. The government is stepping in and underwriting an awful lot. Or society can run into a fascist mode, which is what happened in Germany and Italy to a point. So that's the danger today, is leaving the back door open for a strong man to appear and say, I've got all the answers to this, I can solve the unemployment problem, I can solve the asset problem, and so on and so forth. We have to be extremely careful, because this guy, whatever you think of him, he was ruthless, he was a brilliant actor, and he also he was a psychologist. How many people in the audience have read Mein Kampf? In Mein Kampf, there are two really, really important things. Hitler actually called his people stupid. The masses were stupid. In other words, he realized the possibility of manipulation here. He also was absolutely convinced he could have an alliance with the UK to take care of the Western approaches to the Atlantic and the Italians to the south, leaving him time to deal with the Russians, which is where he saw German expansion. He was wrong. But he had an enormous influence, obviously, on the century. 
The Berlin Wall, that was constructed in 1961, came down in 1989. And OPEC, these are petrol pumps here, but OPEC was born actually in 1961. So oil, of course, becomes an increasing part of the, uh, the, the world economic situation and how we behave. 1961, you'll, you'll be familiar with these four. Actually, Anne, my wife, saw them in, uh, in concert. Or, no, concert's probably a bit generous, but at a, at a party. So, uh, experiments in sight and sound really started in the 1960s. The lyrics of Cohen, Dylan, that sort of thing, becoming really quite important. The Vietnam War, this guy looks terribly young to be in, ch in charge of a rifle and going out, but this is the way of war. Uh, the Americans lost a quarter of a million dead in Vietnam, and they never even declared war on the Vietnamese, so they didn't actually extend a lot of dignity to the conflict even then. The Twin Towers, well, since this happened, 9-11, of course, we have seen the state-sponsored removal of freedom bit by bit. All sorts of things done in the name of war on terror, things like that. Not good, and we are not actually being given in many cases... Parliament is rushing through things on the guillotine motions, and this is all done for our general good. However, we are not being involved. And we really need to take this very, very, very seriously. We obviously have had two, two Iraqi wars, the second one, the second of which is going on. Interestingly, the Iraqi war, the Americans, if you've read Scott McClellan, who actually worked for George Bush, the 16 words that started all this off are as follows. The British government has learnt that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. That's how the last Iraqi war started. That was the justification. Must a properly functioning democracy be measured by the ability of its members to be conned? Because we've been conned. Okay. How many people turned out on the streets to say, we don't want this? Ignored. The deal was done. Okay. 2004, 2047. Bit of speculation here. This is when Parallel Community was born in 2006, of which Anne and myself, Hamish Miller, Bar Miller, various others were founder members. Parallel Community actually has a lot to do with how many people who say, well, I'm only, I'm only one, I don't, I don't matter, my voice, I'll, no one will ever listen to me. Well, that's actually true. One person very difficult to actually get some sort of recognition for your views. However, one of the current political insults is our leaders saying, well, we speak for the silent majority. Do you? Do you really? Because time and time again you hear things that actually, this simply isn't true. And it's high time that the people who say, well, wait a minute, none of this seems to represent me, and yet here I am, I have a vote. Because the first... Reform Act of 1832, up until 1928, when women and men over the age of 21 got the vote. That took 96 years to get it. MPs were paid for the first time in 1911. It took them 98 years to get found out. But, okay. So Parallel Community was formed really to, to, to give people their voice back. And one of the original six declared aims was that it is our right to live in peace, and it's our right to claim that for ourselves as well. So don't go to war on some pretext. Anything less than the truth will not do. You do not send the cream of society to die in the numbers that they are dying. The first war demonstrated this, and uh, I can... Well, we all know that millions literally died pointlessly in World War I. Uh, you don't actually, when, the, when one side uses high explosives, you don't send shrapnel in the other direction. It just doesn't work. So a parallel community set up to give people a voice. Very important. Now, as far as the, the rest of this time, this is uh, a generous 43-year speculation. What will happen in 2047? Of course, we just don't know. Now, the first thing, free trade. I've got here free trade, the only way that the globe, the nation that wealth is going to be much more evenly distributed is free trade, genuine free trade. Again, the politicians sit around at various conferences and say, oh, yeah, we're going to have free trade. We're going to drop tariffs on this, that, and the other. It doesn't really seem to happen, does it? We'll go through some of the numbers on where the money is and where the people are, and they're not all in the same place. 
That we'll cover in some detail. Now, education. I have yet to find anybody tell me what's going on with the education system. Why is it everyone gets A grades at A level? Everybody. Why is it that everyone's got degrees in media studies? Why is it that when I was an employer and I wanted a warehouse man, I had 24 applications and 22 of them could not fill out one sheet of A4 paper? One chap said, well, I live in so-and-so. And I said, write it down for me. He said, but you know where it is? It's around the corner from the White Horse pub. I said, I want you to write the address down. Couldn't do it. Until such time as the education system actually yields what it is that is needed, and this is where some of the developing economies, economies like China and India are actually beginning to score because they know what's needed. We don't, again, we're not, simply not coming up with the truth on the education issue. And to actually encumber students with endless debt, not only do they come out of a university education, which in many cases is meaningless, they come out absolutely saddled with thousands of quids of the debt. Now, this is the really cynical behaviour of this current lot. If you owe £20,000 and you go for a job and you're lucky enough to find one and get it, you cannot tell your boss to shove his job. You are already a conservative with a big C. This is before you've met the woman of your dreams, bought a house, had kids, and the debts go on. All of a sudden, there you are. You've seen them all in the estate agent suit. Tie, same haircut, everything. Absolutely trapped. There is no way out. This turns society into government control, totally, because there's no way out for these people. So to send people to say that you want half the population to go to university, and they, they come out saddled with those sorts of debts, it's not, it's not fair. It's not democratic, and it isn't free. So I really I take exception to that because we have to educate properly and the education system is is dire. Those of you who know Hamish Miller, Hamish is an absolute inspiration. Hamish is Hamish and Barr, his wife. Those of you who know Hamish from Dazzy, he was here talking last year. He has produced a DVD, Hamish, on Parallel Community. Now Hamish is not short of years, as all of you know. He is an absolute inspiration because he, he is a classic case of just because i am got grey hair and I'm beyond retirement doesn't mean I have to stop caring. And Hamish cares passionately about all the injustice that happens. Why is it that when we get to retirement age, all of a sudden it's, uh, well, it's the turn of the young now. The young people can do it. Excuse me? You've got the experience. You might even have a few bob. To turn around and then say, well, the young will take care of it. I've seen it all before. Been round, gone round. What goes round comes round. Come on. We have the, to a great degree, some of us have got the experience. Why don't we actually continue to maintain an interest? I'll tell you the one good reason. My pension was an equitable life. Wrong. They took that. Anyone who thinks they're going to get a generous state pension? Wrong. They're going to take that too. So you really do need to care. It's absolutely crucial. And Hamish, on this particular DVD, it won't surprise you to know that I do have some for sale available outside. There are a few. This will actually very carefully explain precisely what Parallel Community is all about. And it's a fascinating thing. We now have connectors in many, many countries. And slowly, bit by bit, momentum is building. This is where the voice is. This is where some of the freedom can come back to the individual and says, right, you are not on your own. Because if you feel on your own, you don't have to be on your own. So, these days there are 500 million of us in the European Union in 25 stroke 27 countries. It's very easy to lose, to lose count. We are very, very unlikely now to get into a punch-up with one another, thank God, because we all recognize, fortunately, a little bit of progress is being made here. We are absolutely dependent on each other. We are all part of the same system, genuinely coherent. For every action, there's a reaction. Some of you may have heard me say this before, but it's absolutely true. And there are now so many mixed interests that I think trade is so much more important to us than war. 
And what is war? War is generally done by blokes in coloured clothing who kill each other with equipment. What's that about? Why? Why don't we just stop it? Is it so totally impossible to actually abolish it and just say, no, we don't want to do this anymore? Because war tends to be the result of a breakdown of diplomatic negotiation. The sad thing is it's increasingly now being done by ladies too, and that's a real shame. We need to stop. This is me in Laos over the winter, and I'm sat here having breakfast, and that is an American cluster bomb found in the area, and it's kind of a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit unsettling when uh, you know you 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 suddenly realise that there's tons of the world in the killing business and there's tons of the world in the survival business. Nuclear proliferation, of course, is a huge problem. Mutually assured destruction theory is no longer valid, if it ever was, because Stalin didn't mind to lose 20 million of his people. It was the different. We actually gave some credibility in the West to the individual life. But it is extremely disturbing to realise these people, Laos is a gorgeous country, those of you who, who have not been something in the order of 80% of the original rainforest and everything else is still there. We went up the Mekong River in a packing case. Well, it was, felt like a packing case. It was two by one timber with an espresso machine on the back and it was loosely called a boat. It got us there just and there was a German lady saying, where is the life jacket? They promised me there would be a life jacket. And I said, no, no, you don't get a life jacket. So, uh, interesting. The nuclear proliferation issue, obviously we have a major problem here because if, if uh, the whole, I think the moment the, the fulcrum of world, world politics really does lie in Pakistan because if the Taliban actually got control of Pakistan and acquire nuclear weapons, room for a tough ride. Uh, it, it begs the question, you know, what is the half-life of unperturbium? I don't think any of us ever know. Einstein and Russell in 1955, Einstein has, you know, E equals mc squared, etc. We've got a, quite a big influence here. But Einstein signed a paper with Bertrand Russell. Uh, Bertrand Russell's grandfather saw the first Reform Act through in 1832. In 1955, there was a conference at the Caxton Hall in London, and Einstein signed a paper which said, and Russell, we're bringing the warning pronounced by the scientific signatories to the notice of all the powerful governments of the world in the earnest hope they may agree to allow their citizens to survive. They were, what Einstein was very worried about what he'd done. And anecdotally, he would, if he had his chance to uninvent what he'd done, he would have done it. But of course, this comes down to the question then, who controls? I mean, you know, what we have to actually acquire a little bit of wisdom in addition to actually making things, and we're not doing it at the same pace. That's a major problem. Okay. Poverty of politics. Wow, well, there's plenty of that going on. Right, you might ask, what have these two got in common? HP source. Well, there's a lot of brown stuff been coming out of, uh, out of Parliament, as we all know. Um, Solve the problem? Well, the politicians really are the problem, aren't they? I'm not going to bang on about the expenses issue. Suffice to say this. As a very junior salesman in the 1970, I think it was, I remember one of my colleagues being hauled up in front of the boss and said, look, you know, these expenses don't look too good. He said, he looked him straight back in the eye and he said, uh, if you think it's in there, boss, find it. So the moral of the story is, if you're going to cheat your expenses, at least do it sophisticatedly enough that your average accountant and boss isn't going to find it. It's perfectly possible. So what they've done in Parliament is they've actually, most of them have actually played the game as they wrote the game for themselves, but the true idiots are the ones that have uh, done things, claimed for mortgages that didn't exist. They could be found out. That is dumb. Any junior salesman of 20 years old will tell you how to fiddle the swindle sheet. Now, HP source. Brownian motion is the erratic movement in random directions without any clear objective. Ring any bells? <laughs> Labour Party policy, perhaps? I might also pay tribute to Private Eye here because they actually have a column called HP source. And HP source, for those of you who don't know, Houses of Parliament source. And it's brown and it's strong. We love it. We put it on everything in the UK. So I'll go on to what got in common with this over here in a second. So. 
The other problem we have with politics, I think, at the moment is what I call the permanent campaign. When does the election campaign actually finish and the job of government start? <laughs> Anyone know? No, of course you don't, because it's constantly going on. We constantly have an election campaign going. Any, man, any manifesto they produce, we know is worthless. We don't even bother reading them anymore. What's the point? It's nuts. And again, these people all, again, talk for the silent majority. I'm, we're for the silent majority. So, in other words, if the policy suits us, we'll do it, knowing the silent majority is behind us. Again, this is absolute nonsense. Now, that's fine. I said in the beginning there are three things we have to actually bring to the party these days, one of which is just don't bitch, moan and complain. Okay. So what's the deal here? Okay. Our friends in Switzerland, who are bright enough not to be a member of the Economic European, European Union, they have a system which they have about 3,000 communes. Now that is, to you and me, parish council. Okay. They then have cantons, about 26 of them. So elected representatives from the communes go to the cantons, and then they have federal government. So they have three tiers. If you want to call a referendum, you can do that. Just get 50,000 signatures and say, I don't like this. Find 50,000 people to agree with you, and not crazy names, prove who you are, blah, blah, blah then you can get a proper discussion going. This means you cannot just rip away good law and put in stupidity. So we have something to learn here. So I think there's a method of reform we can look at. As I say, if you've got a local problem, call for a referendum, get 50,000 supportive signatures. And you must prove that you actually live in those boundaries. In other words, no flying pickets saying, don't like this in Exeter and I live on the Isle of Skye. Not quite right. So this number is actually, we divide the country up into half a million blocks. So that would be 10%. So if 10% of enough people actually care, okay, you can get a discussion going. I suggest that's a good possibility for a genuine policy requirement by local people, particularly on things like education and so on. Okay, now, here's where we get really fascinating. Local government. I'll go on a bit later to explain how we can solve all our financial problems by dealing with local government. They printed recently 125 billion pounds. We can actually take some lessons from Robert Mugabe. If Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe had printed 125 billion dollars, what would everybody have said about the guy? Irresponsible, can't do that. Well, we've done it, we've just done it. And we can get all of that back by abolishing every quango in the country. Because what, is, what does a quango do? I'll tell you what it does initially. A quango will do what it's set up to do. Watch people down the left side of the pavement. That's fine, so it'll do it. And then eventually that gets lost, and what it does is garner power, and keeps power, and absorbs loads of money. So. Those district assemblies, we don't have to have a prescribed size, but these are what we currently, or if you're still lucky enough to have them, parish and district councils. We would have one regional assembly for every half a million people. That means for the number of people who live here, we would have 125 assemblies in the UK. Now, we've got those, we've got all the halls here. We've all got a parish and a district. We've got a parish hall in, in most of our communities. Here we have county councils. Okay, so we've got the buildings. We don't have to spend any money to do this. We've got the buildings. 125 assemblies of a half a million people. And we'll give two MPs to each regional assembly. So that's one MP for every quarter of a million. Right now we've got an MP for every 90,000. That's ludicrous. And they're buying rocking chairs, and they're draining moats, and they're buying duck houses, and they're doing this, that. And they're all of them eating 5,000 quid worth of grub every year, that sort of thing. Now... We have a National Assembly, which formerly used to be known as Parliament. Okay? We don't need 646 MPs. 250 will do. Thank you very much. How much saving have we got? How much nearer, interestingly, how much nearer the truth are we going to get? So, we have two MPs from each regional assembly elected to a National Assembly by proportional representation. So there's none of this cheating, none of this forming governments with 22% of the vote. Won't happen. So this will give us 250 MPs. Does that strike you as being slightly more sensible than what's going on at the moment? I think it is. Now, 
Interestingly, this National Assembly is only concerned with what I call supranational issues, trade, stuff we can't do locally particularly. International trade, foreign policy, currency are three classic examples of what a National Assembly could actually do. And on the bottom here, stay out of local government. Do not tell us how to educate our kids at local level. Do not inflict curricula on us that we do not want. Because if we are parents, don't tell us what our children do need. Because we know people in the community who can do that. So I would legislate to stay out of, just keep out of it. So the National Assembly has absolutely nothing to do with what happens at local level. Nothing. Why? What possible care is it of Whitehall what happens in Falmouth, Cornwall? And I've got history here because I stood as an independent MP at the last general election, so I know how it works. Not a lot of fun. So this now becomes just another real thing on waste. Is devolution necessary? Well, again, you could call a referendum. If you want a devolution for Glastonbury, call one and find if you can find enough people who want to do it. Now, if in Scotland they want a National Assembly, that's fine. I've got no problem with it. Same in Wales. But pay for it. Because in Switzerland, if you live in a canton and you don't like that canton's policy, you move somewhere else. And that's fine, because in Zurich they speak German, and in Geneva they do French. Slightly different here, but there are subtle differences. If the population sees no point in paying the taxes, and I can promise you they won't, okay, no more devolution. And we look at the huge costs involved, and guess what? Who pays? We do. Why? It's waste. So those are just a few proposals on how we might actually change what's going on, because we have to. We know. We feel it. We smell it. We see it. And we smell and see the lies that this is no longer a free issue. This is serious. And talking of serious, was this such a great idea? Here we have, jumping to the Middle East here, 1923-1947, Palestine, Dead Sea, Transjordan. Here was the solution, putting Israel in here. Now, we have major, major problems as far as the Middle East is concerned. And let me read you, for those of you who are not familiar with the Balfour Declaration, here is what it said. And remember, this is in response to somebody who made acetone from maize and horse chestnuts. When asked what would he like for himself, Weizmann said, I don't want anything, but I do want some help for the Jewish people in the Middle East. So Lloyd George said, fine, gave him to Balfour. Balfour said, okay, what do I need to do? And this is what Balfour's declaration states. In a letter to Rothschild, it says, it be clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So what that means is, if you want to do this, that's fine, but do not upset the people who are already there. And it's come back to haunt everybody ever since. And the fact that this whole area floats on oil has really made it very, very complicated. Now, interestingly, I've spent quite a lot of time in Israel, and everybody there will tell you that if the Americans stop bankrolling it, it's all over. So if the checks stop from the Israelis, that's fine. Now, that's one serious issue, but of course, Palestine's another thing, because what do the Arabs think about the Palestinians? Now, they are not the top of the pile as far as a lot of the Arab countries are concerned. So it's not a question of what all the fuss is about because I, th I think it's a pretty serious deal. But if a proposal here, if the amount of money that was given to Israel was given in a like way to Palestine, and I'm not talking about the armaments industry, somehow stop that, although Ian Crane <laughs> rightly say can't do that, if they had airports, education systems, sewers, clean water, all the other basic needs, there may be some possibility of actually getting some kind of peace going here. But it's really it's incredibly difficult. When you see what happened after 1967, the Israeli gains, although they gave this back in 1982, this is the problem on the West Bank, 
and building what is effectively something rather looking like the Berlin Wall around the place is not going to be an answer to any of this. This is nonsense. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. So, major problem. Frankly, it won't last unless something serious is done, and that's a proper allocation of resources. Okay, I'm going to come on to needs, wants, and desires. <laughs> this guy walking down a beach in Thailand with poles. Why? Does he actually need this? Absolutely extraordinary. Now, these guys following him with a backpack, they needed those. That's actually useful. The point here is we have needs, we have wants, we have desires. Needs, basic needs which a lot of the human race simply doesn't have, of clean water, decent air, and, and shelter, things like that. Again, everything that's incarcerated in the UN resolutions is not happening. So we have an incredible situation where something, it's just, it just got there. I mean, does he really need them? You know? We are going to be in a situation where some kind of balanced demand is going to have to happen. We are producing so much stuff in the economy that we don't actually need. The advertising industry converts, we might want something, but then the advertising industry converts that into a hard burn desire. And my classic thing is sofas. <laughs> you know, two years ago, as you heard, said, how many sofas do you need to sit on? We, had, we, have the, we now have the most incredible situation. I get in a car. Uh, my last car was written off, and, and a friend of Hamish just gave me another one. We've been rolling around then ever since. It goes forward and it goes backwards. It's terrific. It's actually about what I need. But now we have a situation where we have a car that shakes its ass. Excuse me. We have another one that conveys a thing called auto-emotion. What the hell is that? I, if I understood what it was, you know, my relationship with the internal combustion engine is not that serious that I have to have a damn relationship that's called auto-emotion. I mean, and another one says, move your mind. Well, I damn well hope so, because if it's moving me from A to B, I hope my mind comes with me. <laughs> but all this stuff is put out as, I mean, and, and there's these gorgeous pictures of uh, cars going, and they're all on the left side of the road, you'll note, or the right side, whichever, anyway, the wrong side to us. Basically, shot on the Riviera, fabulous weather. What we're being asked to buy here is, of course, the story. This, what's going to be ours if we have auto emotion, move our mind? And my car shakes its own ass. Well, I should hope so. If I go backwards, that's what I'm asking it to do. But the whole thing is about converting what actually I, need to, I may need to go to work in my car. I may not want to go to work in the first place, but I need the thing. That's fine. If I have a want, well, it would be nice to have. Then the advertising boys get hold of it and turn that into a hard burned desire. Got to have that. And that is a wasteland because I didn't know I wanted it in the first place. Buy one, get one free. No, no, no. When you are offered, my business, a pair of glasses for £100, you get a free one. I suggest you do this. You go in there and say, but I only want one pair for £50. <laughs> See what you get because the cost of the second pair you paid for in the first one. Okay? They call it bog off. Buy one, get one free. I call it a con. It's a con. So if you, uh, someone says to you, I'll sell you two pairs, two pairs you get two pairs of glasses for 100 pounds, I only want one for 100, or for 50. Okay? See where you go. Nowhere. So it's not true, and it's not honest. So we get into an interesting situation here. I call this greed house. Who stole our $50 trillion? Where's all the money gone? Matter of interest. We were in Turkey last September, and the papers turned up, and Lehman, Beers, Beer Stearns, all these people, all the banks going bust. What the hell's going on? Who's, who stole the money? Uh, if you look at $50 trillion, or whatever the numbers are, it's a really hard thing to steal. You need a lot of trucks, pantechnicons full of trucks. So the answer is the money was never there, was it? This is bonkers. And the same people are in charge of the asylum who took us there in the first place. It's not honest. It's not free. It's not true. Geithner is in charge of the American financial system. Who does he work for? Goldman Sachs. Even he, you know, <laughs> he'll admit it, I think. So the whole thing is absolutely ridiculous. And guess what? We have the shoots of recovery. Do we? 
House prices haven't started yet. This whole thing is nuts. You cannot borrow money and walk away. You cannot borrow money and go bust. There is a system for doing it, but they'll, it's not that easy. Otherwise, we'd all be doing it. It's not honest. If you borrow money, the person you borrow it from sooner or later is going to want it back. Isn't he? Isn't she? It's going to happen. So you, can't, you just can't do that stuff. You can't just acquire the money. We buy a house. We've regarded it as an investment. We actually need to live in it. The whole thing has gone completely ridiculous. Now, the only honest way out of the problem we're in at the moment is to let the debt happen. Let the debt get got out of the way. It's sad, but it's true. You cannot print £125 billion without making, producing something. It will be inflationary. It has to be. They're telling us this lovely, lavatorial-sounding word, quantitative easing. Sounds like something when you sit in the toilet, it would be relaxing. I mean, it's horrendous. You cannot print £125 billion. You just can't do it. Now, another thing. What about the money factory? Print £125 billion. Excuse me, Stan. Where do we set the noughts? I sent an email to a prominent scientist, and I said, how many noughts in a billion? He said, depends what side of the Atlantic you're on. <laughs> I, send an e I sent an email to my daughter, a qualified accountant. Bless her. How many noughts in a billion? Depends what side of the Atlantic you're on. So how the hell do they set the machine to print the money in the first place? It's that crazy. I mean, it's a lot of dough. It's nuts. And if you don't actually make something to make the money to do that, it has to be inflationary, which means we are saddled, our children are saddled, our grandchildren are saddled with debt. And the only honest answer to this is it's got to be paid. Why keep industries, whole industries, producing stuff that no one wants to buy? It's a lie. It doesn't work. So it's, it is. It's a house of cards. And it has to be told, because um, I know that Ian Crane is going to back this up later on. It has got to stop. It will have to stop, because we're not being truthful with one another. We're not being told the truth. This stuff is serious. This is how silly it is. Local estate agent where we live on the Isle of Wight has these details. See the pyramids of Giza in the background. Detached character property. Unique desert location. Many chambers with original features. <laughs> Panoramic views. Hand-built to high standard. Allocated camel parking. Well, if you can't sell a house in town, sell an Egyptian one. This is crazy, but it just shows you how stupid this has got. So, right, now, technological divide. We have, there are two, there are two types of technology, really. We have good technology, we have bad technology. Okay? This is good technology. Money, real money, cash, coin. Something you can actually use. This is actually bad technology. Credit cards, bad technology. Charge card, good technology, because you have to pay it off every month. So this is bad news. We have to actually, I was talking earlier on about children coming out of a university with huge debts. This actually gives the boss sinister power. This is the guy who can actually decide your life. And actually, if you are in hock so badly that you are up to here and you think, oh, I can't upset the boss, I can't come up with anything original or exciting because I might lose my job. You're in the hole. You're stuck. Nothing you can do about it. Okay? Remember, we were all told about the 20-hour working week. Remember in the late 60s, 70s, we were only going to work 20 hours a week. What the hell were we going to do with the rest of it? What was our response? Let's find something new to spend the money on so we can work harder. So that's what we did, only we didn't pay for it. So there we are. So... Has the quality of life gone up or down as a result of that, as we surround ourselves with all this stuff? Can't let the cards go without talking about ID cards, very briefly. Identification cards, bad news, very bad news. Because people who say, well, we carry a credit card, we carry a driver's license, what the hell's the difference? Why, can, why, why not carry another identity card? Because what you carry now, you could take out to a bin in the car park and put it down and it's no one's affair. An identity card they will force you to carry. Again, this is a reduction of freedom. We don't need this. The formation you've all been waiting for. <laughs> the, anomalous, the anomalous effect at 25 to 6. Now, this, sort of, this illustrates how crazy it can get, and it's nuts. Okay. Why do we embrace waste? I mean... <laughs> 
There is a grave danger, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to thump on any length about um, the environment, etc., because I'm sure that will be done. But uh, we have an awful problem that a little bit of extra recycling, people coming back from the supermarket with a jute bag, they'll think, right, I'm doing my bit for the whole environment thing now, don't need to do any more, I'm doing fine. That's fine, but we have to do very, very much more, and it does involve massive changes in lifestyle. And we have to be honest and face this. To be able to get on an aeroplane and fly to the south of Italy for what is actually for nothing, apart from government taxes and so on, is bonkers. We are screwing the environment rotten. We know we are. The, air, the aviation industry will say, well, no, we're, we're very small polluters. And that's fine. But in the old Soviet Union, you could fly from Moscow to Vladivostok for 50p. You can do it now. We've actually learned from them. And I think it's Ryanair actually saying, well, you know, the, the ambition is not to charge people at all because they're subsidized by the people they fly to. They can sell you fluffy bunnies. They can sell you sandwiches, water on the plane, that sort of thing. Charge you to use the loo. And if you're a kilo overweight, you can pay a pound, that kind of stuff, you know. Now, pointless consumption is one thing. But the other thing is people say, well, you hear, the, hear this very often. We only use 10% of our potential. And people who are in tune with earth energies and things like this are the ones that, you know, Hamish, for example, good example. People who are actually in tune with the earth and who are, can do the dousing things and so on and so forth are actually starting to, to dip into the things that we no longer care to bother with or understand. If we use 10% of our potential, there are 8,766 hours available to us every year. That's how long it is. If we spend eight hours a night asleep, that comes down to 5,844 waking hours. 10% of that's 584 hours, or 1.6 hours a day. Is that very good use of the best piece of kit ever invented? Not really. So we're in a situation where, of our own admission, most of us will say, well, we don't operate to our full potential. One and a half hours a day isn't very good. We can do better. So it's time we started actually realizing we can actually go a little bit further than this. We can look a little bit harder at everything that we do. Okay. Okay, very quickly. The public sector needs clearing up. Close all the quangos, save 130 billion. Stop paying bonuses. Stop the advertising and using outside consultants. So many things can actually clear up the financial waste as well. Otherwise, if we don't, look who's going to inherit the world. <laughs> we have Mr. Fly here. This is on top of a ketchup bottle in Cambodia, actually. So if, if we don't clear up, they're waiting to inherit, no problem. You know? So there we are. Okay. World population, 1789, we had a billion. 1918, we had a two billion. Look how fast it's growing. Now, 2047, nine billion. An awful lot of folk. Now, there's ways of actually... At the moment, here is where the people are. 20 uh, the, the developed countries, 20% of the people, 55% of the GDP. Developing economies, 66, 42 of the GDP. Africa, 14 and 13. So together, there's 80%, 45% of the assets. If we, suggestion for world government here, if we have one, one world representative per 35 millions, developed countries by population will give us 39, and by GDP will give us 106. Developing nations, 127, and Africa, 27. So they have 87 against our 106. Now, at the moment, current population, 6 billion, 750 million, 193. If we go out and redistribute this slightly, it doesn't need much change to actually start to get this a little more equal. Very, very little. Because as long as these people don't have proper representation, the developing, and, and Africa is just sad because it's made no progress whatsoever. Okay. I urge you, those of you who have not looked at the Parallel Community website, have a look. There is a place on there called the Meeting Place. This is where you can actually log your, what you want to do, or if you've got any opinions, or you've got a, an event that you would like publicized, or anything like this, have a look at the Parallel Community website because this is about freedom. This is the... This is the elixir of life, because imagine if you weren't free. Incidentally, how's the pulling going? Okay. 
won't surprise you perhaps to know that uh, very shortly um, publishing a book can, which a lot of this stuff in very, very much more detail is being produced. And I, there are actually a collection of 12 essays on the subjects that I think um, are extremely important for the future of the human race. And that should be out, I think, in uh, September. So the inference here is you're pulling and you're pulling. Okay, now we're the, in, in mythology, what happened, the gods actually did a dirty deal with the demons. This is why the gods actually are the good guys and the demons are not. The gods actually stole more than their share of the elixir. Okay? Now, we're such nice people, we don't do this. So you get half, you get half. We all get the same. Okay? We can do this together. We can do this change together. We can do the freedom thing together. We can do the truth thing together. Because if we don't, the consequences are far, far too dire. We need to think very, very seriously about what it is that we do and what we're prepared to put up with from the people who purport to represent us. Because if you're a member of the silent majority, you don't have to anymore say, well, no one listens to me. That's true, they won't. But if enough of us get together and if enough of us say, look, this is nonsense... They can't ignore it. In the end, it will become a huge voice for popular recognition. It isn't right that a million people take to the streets and then they're promptly ignored. It can't be right. And please value, value, value this freedom thing. So we really can do this together, okay? So I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Citizen Smith. Thank you.